So good afternoon uh, or good evening or good morning uh, for all of the folks in our Zoom nation. I'm Mabel Wilson and I'm the director of the Institute for Research in African Amer American Studies, as well as a professor in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies here at Columbia. And I wanna begin by situating the university and myself on the traditional land and unceded territory of the Lenape, Lenape. We pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, present and future rights of the Lenape, Lenape on their rightful homeland. So for the past 29 years, IRAS, which is the Institute for Research in African American Studies, founded by the late Professor Manning Marable, has been a fierce advocate of social responsibility and justice in Black studies. Dr. Marable offered a prescient reminder in a New York Times article from 1998 that, quote, Black studies must utilize history and culture as tools by which an oppressed people can transform their lives and the entire society. Scholars have an obligation to not just interpret, but to act, end quote. The Institute serves as an academic resource center for a local and global community that has cultivated an intellectual tradition grounded in Harlem and New York City's rich history and culture. Now in partnership with our Department of African-American and African Diaspora Studies, Triple ADS as we refer to it, we continue to expand the array of contemporary scholarship and interpretation of the diasporic Black experience like this academic year special series, Black Counter Cartographies, co-sponsored by the Institute for Comparative Literary Studies and the Center for the Study of Ethnicity, Race, and Race here at Columbia. Conceived with my colleague, Dr. Vanessa Agard-Jones, who is unfortunately unable to join us today, Black Counter Cartography brings together in dialogue geographers and artists, poets and architects, and a series of conversation exploring the spatial practices of Black life across the diaspora and how they construct what scholar Impul Matsipa calls counter cartographies of sociality, imagination, and liberation. Geographies encapsulates modernity's production of space and time, subjected to the metrics of markets and politics. Within that sphere, the racialization of peoples of African descent has historically and continues to produce sites of extraction, exploitation, dispossession, and displacement. The emerging fields of Black geographies challenges this discursive formation and reimagines the cadences of everyday spatial practices. And so for our fourth conversation in the series, we couldn't think of two people whose work engages Black counter-cartographic spaces between the sites of the continent and diaspora than scholar Simone Brown, an artist, graphic designer, and educator, Nancy Matuti. Now, Dr. Simone Brown is an associate professor in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies, the University of Texas at Austin. She is also research director of Critical Surveillance Inquiry, CSI with Good Systems, a research collaborative at the University of Texas at Austin. Simone's book, Dark Matters, uh, amazing book, you can see I've got it <laughs> tapped here, on surveillance of blackness, was awarded the 2016 Laura Romero First Book Publication Prize by the American Studies Association. And along with Deborah Cohen and Catherine McKittrick, Simone is a series editor of Aaron Trees at Duke University Press. Dr. Brown is the 2021 Matadia Research Fellow at the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University. Now, Professor Nancy Kelo, Kelele Lo Matuti, or Nancy as we call her, uh, is a Zimbabwean born visual artist and educator. She's invested in elevating the work and practices of Black people's past, present, and future through a conceptual approach to design, publishing, archival, archiving practices, and institution building. Professor Matuti holds a diploma in multimedia from the Zimbabwe Institute of Digital, of, uh, Digital, Art, or Digital Arts, uh, Ziva, and an MFA from the Yale School of Art with a concentration in graphic design. Professor Matuti is 
the Director of Graduate Studies for Graphic Design at the Yale School of Art. So after presentations by Dr. Brown, followed by Professor Matuti, we will have a conversation and then open it up to the audience for Q&A toward the end of the event. So please, and we'll remind you to po post your questions in the Q&A window on Zoom. You, you can't post in chat, but you will be able to post in the Q&A window on Zoom. And so now I will turn it over to Simone. Uh, thank you, Mabel, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be in conversation uh, with you all here. Um, and let's go. So I went to MoMA yesterday, which gave me a chance to sit with Black Power Naps. La Biblioteca is open. It's an interactive uh, installation created by artists Navid Acosta and Sosa. It's a space in which to practice rest as a form of, re of reparations. You enter the space and you can either take off your shoes or put on blue disposable shoe covers and then lie on the rugs and cushions or crawl up on one of the mattresses on risers. You can read a book from the traveling biblioteca to learn about the politics of rest and refusal. From the wall essay, we learn about the racial sleep gap and that rest is a luxury for many and that the artists locate the ongoing black exhaustion to the use of sleep deprivation as a, of the enslaved as a method of policing, plantation management, and a surveillance. And the Wall essay also tells us that Acosta and Souza, quote, actively reject this legacy and claim power in rest, inviting you to imagine a world in which leisure, downtime, and quality of sleep are available to all. Yesterday, when I was there, some people were really sleeping, like in a deep sleep, slumber. It was crowded at times, and some people reclined and they scrolled on their phones. Black Power Naps is an interrogation on repair, reparation, replenishment, and rest. Throughout the museum, as in many of these institutional spaces, there are a lot of Black security guards, standing sometimes eight hours a day. These are the category of workers that make the museum space possible. In MoMA's exhibition, Beyond the Uniform, security officer Kevin Reed reflects on Kerry J. Marshall's untitled policeman. Kevin Reed says, I think people just see me in a uniform but don't know who I am. If you take your time to just talk with me, then you'll know I'm much more than a uniform. I'm standing right in front of you. You ain't looking hard enough. The Black security card guard occupies a category of laborers that come to stand for something specific about working in the museum service sector, that being that they might not be able to access the very thing that they are tasked with protecting, those spaces of rest and reparation. In 2021, I was asked to write a dream incubation text as part of a series, um, as part of artists Tika Brain and Sam Levine's app, The Perfect Sleep. The Perfect Sleep is an installation and smartphone app that investigates the potential of sleep, dreaming, and restoration as climate engineering technology. As the artist put it, quote, by inviting participants to experiment with their own sleep cycles, the work explores how lack of sleep and climate change are both products of the same extractivist capitalist system where regeneration, rest, and natural limits go undervalued, end quote. Reef is the title of the dream incubation that I wrote for the smartphone app. It invites sleepers to close their eyes and imagine the ocean and to dream of the endangered coastal ecosystem of the island of Tobago. So Tobago's coral reefs, like many others, have degraded over time. They become vulnerable by pollution and waste mismanagement, algae overgrowth, bleaching, threatened by anchors, deforestation, cl changing climate conditions, and reef walking tourists. So working with these artists allowed me to play a small part in their sleep study, but it also allowed me to reflect on my childhood memories of taking glass bottom boat tours to the island's coastal ecosystem. This would be long before the submarine communications cables like Deep Blue One and America's Two crisscross Tobago's ocean floor. 
the glass bottom boats would take us out to sea maybe about 10 minutes from the shore. And after a short while, the boat's engines will turn off and the anchor is dropped. And you can, if you want, jump in and out and then float, stand up, walk around, snorkel in the clear blue water that is the uh, nylon pool. So after visiting the sandbar, we would climb back up onto the glass bottom boat so that the captain could take us to the second stop, Booker Reef. There we would learn of the boat crews um, how to snorkel and in and around the, co the coral, algae, starfish, stingrays, parrotfish and other marine life. The boat captain would teach you about blue parrotfish that make their home in Booker Reef. The blue parrotfish feed on algae found in the living coral and excrete that coral like sand. In my dream incubation, I reflect on coral. My late uncle would sometimes give me a branch of coral that he would come across on the seashore. He would bleach it and scrub it free of algae and other life matter. I treasure these gifts, but I wonder if they were really mine to accept. Lifeless coral taken from endangered seas. I wonder if this bleach coral would be, could be regenerated somehow. Could it be returned to the reef to repair the coastal life? I want to imagine with others the ways that this precarious C4 life could be renewed. What can we learn from the blue parrotfish about rest and restoration and resilience? When some parrotfish rest, they do so in a cocoon of their own making, a protective mucous membrane sac that could safeguard them from predators and parasites alike, shield them from ultraviolet radiation, and serve as a space of restoration. Parrotfish can be gender non-conforming too. At times, the female parrotfish decides to render themselves male. Could biomimicry be one way of reef restoration? So I was, I guess I wasn't the only one um, asking these questions around biomimicry and reef restoration because in 2021, DARPA's Biological Technologies Office put out a funding opportunity called uh, for Refence. Refence, a portmanteau of reef and defense. Refence is about securing the Department of Defense's infrastructure and other US military installations, but doing so in terms of what they call self-healing for reefs and various other ways to deal with reef decline when it comes to changing sea levels and so on. So I want to think further about DARPA's reef fence and its plan to uh, engineer reef mimicking systems as a military endeavor. And also think more about what Ocean Life teaches us about resilience, resistance, and anti-surveillance tactics. In Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, Alexis Pauline Gum writes, uh, Nubisi Phyllis, uh, Philip taught me that water holds sound and that it can reverberate on and on and keep on calling us. So in 2002, I went back to Tobago, back on the black glass bottom boats of my childhood to connect with some captains and boat workers there. I learned about the kind of um, labor relations that exist where uh, tourists, um, both foreign and domestic, would bargain down prices paid to these low wage work laborers who are dependent on those very tourist dollars. So one thing that I noticed and I heard um, that was different from what I remember as a child were the party boats and the skidoos, uh, soca music mainly loudly booming up and down the, the sea trail. So building on my initial observations, uh, snorkeling and conversations with these black laborers, I'll return shortly to um, Booker Reef to think, about, to think with them around soundscapes and how sound affects coral and uh, the other uh, ocean life and what black ocean labor can teach us about resistance, resilience and reefs. So in notes on in notes towards uh, concealing, sorry, let me start. In notes towards sealing forensic landscapes, M. Norbisi Phillips writes, quote, we in the Americas live in forensic landscapes and we also inhabit the scene of the crime where evidence is erased and destroyed, end quote. And in that essay, she also says that the undersea cables, the mining projects that exploit people, the sweatshops employing low wage workers, all creating this algorithmic landscape. And that too is a forensic landscape. So I think of M. Norbisi Phillips' words when I look back at the photographs that I took um, and the conversations I had in 2019 when I traveled to Abu Goshe in Accra, Ghana. And then at that time, I was interested in the work of um, self taught computer engineers and makers who were repairing and refashioning and rebuilding uh, computers from the secondhand uh, consumer electronics market. 
So one of the questions that framed my interest in this problem of waste work and waste work laborers was uh, what happens when Alexa goes to Accra? That's to say that there are no uh, big, big data, artificial intelligence, ring doorbells and machine learning or voice control digital assistants like Siri and, uh, and Alexa without the materials and the black laborers who make up its infrastructure. So part of my argument here and that I wanted to continue to explore are the ways that electronic waste work um, reveal the co colonial underpinnings of the hardware deemed necessary for algorithms and digital assistants like you know, Echo and Alexa to operate. So from the images here um, of the dismantling, of the dealing of the, of the burning, you can see that you know, cell phones, televisions, uh, small and large household appliances like refrigerators, um, cars, motorcycle pot, uh, parts, computer hard drives, anything with available uh, copper, trace amounts of gold, platinum, or other elements are recycled as part of this market. It's been said that cell phones contain more precious metals by weight than raw ore, and that 1 million uh, recycled cell phones can be rendered into 75 pounds of gold or 772 pounds of silver. So the outcomes of this uh, waste work include toxic exposure to elements such as lead, mercury, plastics, copper, arsenic, um, also soil and drinking uh, water contamination, livestock and food supply contamination, headache burns, respiratory problems, and blurred vision. So this is, this is not only felt by those who do this waste work as their occupation, but also by the people who reside, go to school or work in and just shop or go about their business living in this area of Accra. So when circuit boards are dismantled by hammer and wires are pulled apart by hand, you can see the atomized computer parts all around, like glass screens, batteries, acrylic resin. This particular matter was like um, small uh, gold and copper dust clouds of hazardous air. Um, acrid air from the burning of high impact thermoplastics were about 200 meters away from where I was. Uh, nitrous oxide emissions from the diesel flute fuel and the arsenic, benzene, formaldehyde and nickel that they contain penetrates the lungs and damages lung tissue. Could lead to asthma and other cardiovascular health effects. I couldn't help but think of respiration and the way that atomized computer parts get incorporated into the human body. Breathing in and out the exhaust of algorithmic landscapes is deadly. Respiration of this computing exhaust is a labored breathing. While the dismantling process is, I think, um, akin to what Frantz Fanon in The Wretches of the Earth termed combat breathing, a breathing that is in response to colonial occupation, a breathing that is a bodily contestation of state violence and disregard through this violent arrangement of disposal and disregarded electronic waste. So regarding waste work, we have to situate questions of accountability and our own complicity when it comes to the health effects of the people who do this uh, loosely regulated or unregulated uh, work. These are the people that are dismantling, sorting, dealing in scraps, burning, and sometimes repairing all these electronics like game consoles and cell phones. So waste here is the secondhand consumer electronics and equipment market that's imported um, uh, from sites such as, um, uh, it's imported to sites such as uh, Ghana, India, China, and elsewhere um, that are really um, end of life or near so or non-functional electronics from Europe, the UK, North America. And so while some of these end of life products can be reused or refurbished, the notion of repair seems to be an alibi for getting these products into, um, into the country in order for recycling of copper and aluminum and rare earth minerals. And these materials are then uh, made raw once again, then to be exported out of the country to make new devices. So some questions need to be answered about this garbage imperialism like who's operating in untraceable ways to get minerals like copper out of Awaboshi and to build new what? And who are the lobbying uh, industries uh, that are based in, a, who's lobbying for the industries that are based in this kind of extraction and this labor and this dumping? And what in uh, any role um, you know, does the uh, US have to play there, particularly around the African Growth and Opportunity Act? And also, you know, how a politics of refusal is being enacted by uh, many countries are uh, refusing these garbage dumps. So we must all interrogate the seemingly planned obsolescence of computers, phones, and AirPods that can't be repaired and encourage invention and innovation in recycling. 
um, such as the use of, you know, either robotic disassembly or effective microorganisms or magnetics and ultrasonic uh, sonic means. So I planned to, I had planned to return to Ghana in uh, 2020 in that summer. Um, but by then, what is still the ongoing pandemic made breathing uh, much more uneasy and still in quite uneven ways for us all. So this, th the last uh, section is ash. So Way Free and Ash um, asks about labor extraction and data extraction and the extraction of other planetary re resources um, in places like Accra off the coast of Tobago um, and the, the La Soufre, um volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay, so but first I need to finish uh, you know, uh, hiking up the volcano. I made it about halfway. Um, it was the rainy season. I heard there were pythons, but I didn't want uh, a landslide to be part of my uh, 2022 bingo card. So I'll return there um, to work with um, other laborers, this time the rangers, um, who take care and steward um, the uh, La Soufre volcano. Um, again, to think about um, Black, black uh, laborers uh, in these times of uh, extraction. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Simone. Mabel, is it okay if I go ahead? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to um, continue where uh, Simone started, which was around um, rest and uh, the idea of uh, how that how our bodies as um, immigrant communities, Black people are implicated. Um, but I'll start off by playing a track for you all, um, which is... Chiri 
Um, just tell you a little bit about what you were listening to and introduce you to my uh, family. Um, so the playlist that uh, you were listening to is uh, called Kusina Mai. Um, and uh, that phrase is a term that is used or like a, an idiom that's used in our community back home in Zimbabwe, the Jivano speaking community, um, which means uh, if your mother is not there, if your mother is not there, don't go there. Um, this is my mother on the uh, left-hand side holding one of my older sisters at age one or two. Um, it's 1981, and they're at Heathrow Airport with many of um, uh, my father's relatives um, about to fly back to Zimbabwe. 1981 is the year after Zimbabwe gains independence uh, from the United Kingdom from the Rhodesians and subsequently the United Kingdom. And um, my parents returned home, like many other Zimbabweans that had traveled abroad um, in exile to seek education, to join a uh, political movement building um, that was happening um, outside of our borders. Um, you can uh, meet my father who's on the right-hand side, um, also holding one of my sisters. Now I know the difference. Uh, the eldest is in his arms and then um, the, uh, my sister, Nosisa, who's a year younger than Sitia, the eldest, um, is in my mother's arms. Um, I started to think a lot about um, my own uh, immigration uh, narrative uh, when my aunt passed away. Um, in October last year, uh, she was the keeper of many letters that my mother had written to her when she had left Zimbabwe as a young woman to study in Germany. Um, my mother eventually moved uh, to Zambia, where she met my mother, with my father, and then they traveled uh, to the United Kingdom together, um, and that is where they had my um, older sisters. Uh, the cycle of immigration happens uh, in our family uh, repeatedly, um, people leaving because of war, uh, leaving to make a better life, uh, leaving for political uh, freedom, leaving for um, uh, economic freedom. Uh, but these uh, two things are, are linked. 
Um, I'm a graphic designer. I work a lot with uh, the form of publications. Zimbabwe is uh, known as the most literate uh, country in Africa. Um, we're the most successfully colonized <laughs> nation. One of Britain's uh, um, favorite projects was Rhodesia, the crown, uh, the jewel of the British crown, they used to call us. Um, and part of that, uh, a layer of that is uh, the emphasis on education, a civilizing mandate uh, to make the natives try to perform uh, Western culture to a, to a high degree, sort of a degree of excellence uh, to earn their um value and to be treated uh, slightly more fairly if there's even a gradation of, of that. Um, and so when I was uh, in Richmond, Virginia during the pandemic, unable to travel home, unable to travel to the UK to see my older sisters who eventually moved back uh, to the United Kingdom when Zimbabwe was going through a huge economic crisis, um, I started to think about uh, the songs that would give me comfort and solace, that would keep, make me feel close to home. And I started to collect all these uh, songs by Southern African musicians that listening to them were all talking about work and labor. So much of this work and labor was related to the immigrant um, story. And what you were listening to, Kwasi uh, by Netsai Chigwerere, um, is a song uh, where she is uh, saying to the family, um, listen, everybody, um, our, our father has, uh, not, has left. He has not written back to his children, you know, our brother has left, he has not written back to his children. We all need to stand up and go and find him. He went abroad to, to work. Um, you know, where, where, where has he, where is he hiding? Where's he uh, been drowned? Um, and so this idea of calling out to uh, the community, uh, calling out to those that have uh, left, but also in the playlist, we then get uh, Zarura, where Chirikure Chirikure collaborates with Netsai Chigwedere. And he is uh, taking the voice of the immigrant living abroad, who is lamenting on missing their family, who's lamenting about their spiritual health um, and thinking about how discombobulated they feel, how separate they, they feel from their essence, um, and just wondering where things are going to come back together again. Uh, the fourth song is Shiria Kanaka, which means beautiful bird. And that is the title of this project, um, which is really in its early stages, thinking about a publication that is a paper airplane that uh, at once embodies movement or the possibility of movement, um, but also can uh, carry content and, and these messages uh, to other spaces. Um, Shiria Kanaka means beautiful bird, and the song is uh, mostly known in Zimbabwe as a children's song. Um, it's uh, the, We say Shiria Kanaka, Uno Yendepi, Uya 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 Kuneni, is what the, the bird is saying. Uh, so the child is singing to the bird, little bird, little bird, you know, where are you going? Come to me. And the bird is saying, I'm going away. I'm going away because I want to be as the clouds. I want to be as beautiful as the clouds. I want to do uh, as the clouds can do. I started to think a lot about how my experience of, uh, just my life experience was um, really, uh, an aerial perspective. I travel quite a lot, um, moving uh, between uh, spaces. Um, I connect all my siblings. I'm the one that travels um, most, uh, at least once a year to the United Kingdom and to Zimbabwe. Um, I also have a sibling in um, South Africa. And this uh, pattern of, of you know, flight pattern is quite interesting. You know, it's quite cyclical. Um, it feels like, uh, you know, knitting together of spaces, just like with uh, this um, paper airplane, the kind of bending and folding of space and time. This also happens when I'm reaching out to my family, but not uh, via letter, uh, which is what uh, they were waiting for in the song, uh, Kwasi Wai. They were waiting for a letter from their loved one from abroad. And because they had not received letters, the children had not received letters and the parents had not received letters, everyone had to get up and go in, in, in search of this individual. So I try not to worry my family and make them look for me. I try to message as much as possible, but also show up. And this idea of um, messaging uh, and, and writing is very, very important. I'm trying to bring knit these communities uh, together, knit these time zones together. Um, a publication that I, I was fortunate to design uh, in 2016, um, Asiko, on the future of artistic and curatorial pedagogies in Africa, was initiated by the curator and maverick, uh, B.C. Silver. 
um, through ASICO BC brought together African artists and curators from from different African nations, but also called us home from the diaspora to really be uh, boots on the ground, uh, talking and thinking together about what um, cultural practice and uh, contemporary art practice meant to us from our own perspective. Um, this is the first time that I traveled to the continent of Africa to a nation that I did not have family in, um, but uh, it's quite wonderful to think about the, you know, and I qualify, I, I say that, but actually my father's uh, roots are from Mozambique. So I traveled to Mozambique upon uh, the invitation of um, BC to uh, run a workshop uh, for artists. And through that workshop, um, working with them to make informal publications, um, we ended up collaborating on this larger volume that bridges all the six um, ASICO sessions um, that went to five different cities. Uh, the, the program was run in, um, in Lagos, Nigeria twice, Accra, Ghana. It was run in Mozambique, um, Addis Ababa, um, and I forget the last uh, nation. But it was just such a special uh, moment in time, those six years, for African artists to actually fold and bend space to go into spaces that they shared borders with when oftentimes we are um, more easily drawn uh, to fly abroad. And actually this is an economic thing because it costs the same amount of money for me to fly from Harare to Accra as it does for me to fly from Harare to um, London. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity uh, to have participated as a facilitator, but even more so to work with paper, to work with thread, to bind these spaces together and allow other people to be able to traverse and also for myself to kind of recapture those moments and recapture uh, some of the spaces that I was privileged to enter into. Um, again, thinking about this uh, work uh, with paper and thinking about how it um, can uh, bring us into a spatial relationship uh, and also a, 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 and a relationship with time. Um, our patron saint, Lambuzo Marichera, um, patron saint for the publishing entity Black Chalk and Co that I began in 2015 with Tinashe Mushagavanu, um, was really inspired by uh, the work, the voice and the life of this individual who uh, traveled back home to Zimbabwe without a passport in, um, should have been uh, 1980, if I'm not mistaken, just after independence, uh, and decided, uh, you know, well, he had no passport anymore, so he knew this was his final um, uh, final trip, he was going to remain home in Zimbabwe. He left the United Kingdom where he had um, attempted to burn down the library at Oxford University. Uh, Marichera um, is a uh, there's so much urban myth about this uh, individual uh, in Zimbabwe. There's street corners uh, that people uh, talk about in relationship to moments that he was arrested, uh, places where he used to sleep in the street, um, but he inspired uh, movement building in our nation, inspired the next generation of leadership that uh, became the, the second um, party in our one uh, party system. We had this uh, long run of only having one political party. Um, and so the voice of the writer, the, the one that has uh, been able to use the page to liberate himself, to think about how to spatialize our experience, to write about experiences abroad as if he's back home, to write about home through the lens of being in the United Kingdom. He really allowed us to see uh, into different dimensions and to try to think about what liberation uh, meant, what um, oppression meant, what exile meant, and uh, where there was uh, pro productive language or where there was um, you know, things that we needed to continue to uh, question. Um, we continue to think about uh, Maya Chera by asking other authors and uh, video artists to uh, reflect on his voice and also the voice of other um, writers, stitching their, their narratives together to try to make this tapestry uh, that we can uh, see ourselves uh, through. Um, the Sojourner Project is also uh, um, sort of one of these instances where I've been working to think about how to frame a, a space for different individuals to be in dialogue. Uh, just like some writers where we have many authors speaking 
about the space uh, of Zimbabwe or about uh, Zimbabwean identity as it relates uh, to um, immigration or relates to going on residencies and things like this. Um, this was a, a consortium of uh, academics and artists from the United States and South Africa uh, for this uh, edition who, who wanted to speak uh, together uh, during the time of the pan that the pandemic hit, but were not able to meet um, as they intended uh, in Johannesburg to have a conference. Um, we created this space um, and a visual identity that pointed to uh, Dogon star patterns, that pointed to Ndebele house paintings, using the colors, using the symbols, uh, to think about subversive ways that we've messaged to each other over time, to think about liberation, to think about um, our own languages and how it's important to have a codified uh, language as you are moving between host land, homeland, um, and what it, what it means to be in, uh, in a space um, and to acknowledge uh, identity, but also know that there's certain privileged conversations uh, that are insider and outsider. Um, just thinking again about this idea of uh, symbols that we share uh, throughout the diaspora and how we can capture those, how we can um, how those are replicated across space and time, what those common vocabularies are, even in the things that we that we allow to touch our bodies. Um, I think a lot about the surface um, because I can't always, um, uh, I don't always want to work in uh, paper. You know, paper has got a loaded history um, because of my background as a Zimbabwean and how we were colonized by the book, by the good book, the Bible. Um, I think about uh, trying to work on other surfaces that. Uh, broader audience can see that people can't ignore, that can't be uh, placed in a library um, and just think about what it means to read, read a surface, what it means to scale up some of our symbols um, and also yeah, what it means to write with our own um, languages. Uh, because I travel so much, I really think about taking up space. Um, this mural is uh, in DC, Washington DC, and uh, this part is in Harare, Zimbabwe. And it's the first time where I've uh, understood the fact that um, even as I'm moving between spaces, my work can start to connect um, all these spaces that I occupy, you know, actually physically uh, registering, signaling to each other. Um, and so this uh, mural is the phrase Kusina Mai um, um, mapped onto these two different surfaces, these spaces that I occupy. And the, 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 um, when we say this phrase, we often just say Kusina Mai, and the rest of the phrase lives within the, the, the person that is hearing the warning. Uh, you don't need to repeat it because you know how the sentence ends. Um, and so I, I really um, think sometimes it's important to uh, not give over all the information that uh, there's some things that are just in the know because you're from that community and culture. Um, and you know I just think that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm often thinking about this insider outsider reading when I'm making, um, my work um, and even uh, when the work is uh, based in the United States, I still know that there's other people from Zimbabwe um, that could uh, pass by and uh, read this work with a fuller meaning. At the same time, we do uh, live in community with other um, people who identify as black and that uh, the scripting of these letters with this braided pattern, with this uh, vocabulary that we all share is also a nod and a sign to them that they have kin. Um, and so, yeah, this is where my presentation ends, just really thinking about um, how to connect the spaces that I move through, what it means to have these moments of separation and acknowledging uh, how this um, cycle of uh, leaving home, uh, returning home, exile, um, has been mapped onto uh, my life and, and movement and uh, yeah, trying to make sense of it through uh, my artistic practice. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you both. Um, Nancy, that was that was incredible. And it was sort of great to see uh, arc of your work and also Simone, um, you know, the projects that you've been working on and thinking across. Uh, I just want to remind people that if you have questions, please um, write them into the Q&A since our chat is turned off and this is a webinar. Um, but but really an incredible um, work. And I was just, you know, just thinking around the whole series, um, you know, the kind of connections and synergies that are emerging between, you know, we had um, 
uh, Danielle Purifoy and Jovan Scott, kind of two geographers talking about their work, you know, but both clearly are kind of engaged in artistic and creative practices. You know, Danielle does work with Torquizzi Dyson, and then um, Donette Francis and Farron Humes, Farron's an artist, they're both thinking about you know, blackness and migrations across um, uh, Miami, and then Emmanuel Admasu, I think who you're both, is certainly an answer you know, and uh, Impoma Tsipa, right, from, uh, he's, he's from Ides, Impoma's from jo Johannesburg, but also kind of, you know, sort of thinking about <coughs> the cartographic representation and, and migration and movement. And I think what's interesting in, in, in the ways in which you both started around this question of rest, and I know what that means, because I am exhausted, and I think we are all exhausted, um, and there is a, a kind of way in which we are worked down because a lot of our time is wasted, which wastes our, you know, you know, this constant wearing away. Um, kind of tension between, and maybe it's not a tension, but maybe maybe it's a kind of oscillation between stasis and rest, right, and place, which could also mean enclosure in a negative sense of captivity but also movement and migration and space, which could also be displacement. I mean, I don't think either are positive or negative, but I think there are kind of modes. And I, and I feel both your works certainly talk about or engage, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, kind of migrating across different kinds of boundaries, um, national ones, uh, institutional ones, and, and, and um, but also what does it mean to, to be in place. And particularly, I am interested in this question of rest uh, as well. Um, and then, you know, and I think some of these kind of environmental questions around sort of to toxicity and also the migratory capacity of waste to also produce effects that are deadly, right? That are, are kind of part and parcel, right, of the anti-Black project. So, uh, so, so much to, to discuss, but I was curious about that oscillate relationship between this idea of, of stasis and migration, rest and migration. Yeah, I, I'll jump in because I'm sure Simone has got way more to say. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the playlist that you listened to uh, had a, a predecessor um, where, uh, you know, I was collecting the songs and I found that there were so many songs that were pointing to work ethic. And the song is named after one track called Rambai Makashinga, which means like stay vigilant, you know, prevail. And, it, you know, I really started to think about um, my community, my family, and this idea that there is so much valor in work ethic. There's so much valor in earning one's keep and proving oneself through exerting this labor. Uh, through striving for a kind of excellence, but so much of it is about being seen to be hardworking, to be seen to be diligent, and um, sort of, uh, you know, it's the trope amongst um, my community abroad, uh, you know, Zimbabwean immigrant community in, in the United Kingdom, in South Africa, we are workers, you know, we go there to work, we leave home to work, to work to earn a place, to, uh, to work to earn our keep, to work to um, support family back home to establish uh, a homestead back home to improve the quality of life for others back home and so this idea of labor is continuing to tie us to this economy of extraction um in this economy of trying to um continue to, to kind of cycle value through these systems uh when you think about this huge population of zimbabweans living um in the United Kingdom, you know, after being colonized by the British and Cecil John Rhodes having become the richest man in the world from mineral extraction in our space, you know, it's like uh, we are going back to claim what's ours, but we're still working at the bottom of the food chain uh, most times and uh, often working abroad for for many years, maybe 20 years um, is uh, the typical cycle now in my community. People go away for 10 years without returning back home or 20 years before returning back home. And so these long moments trying to chip away to kind of uh, pull out some value from this um, space, which already has extracted so much um, and has kind of perpetuated this continual cycle, um, almost uh, insatiable kind of appetite that the, that the 
previous uh, colonial power has for like pulling more of the you know former you know oppressed peoples in to continue to prop it up with the promise that they are going to be able to return the value back home. I just wonder if you had thoughts on that. Um, I, I am really struck um, by the black thing, those objects that you just showed us and that that you talked about common vocabularies and common in, uh, imagery um, and uh, signs. So I guess I have a few things and uh, maybe again with um, N. Norbese Phillips uh, discussion of uh, forensic landscapes and the um, algorithmic landscapes of, of extraction um, and uh, and whatnot. And for me, I'm trying to think to put those three sites together. Um, and you know, for one thing, um, you talked about return and not returning for ten years or so. Um, I returned um, with my father to St. Vincent. I'd never been, and he hadn't been since he was probably three or four years old or so. And to think about, you know, for for some. Uh, uh, black, the black experience of migration is is for some is not one of return, but it's a continuing movement. Mm -hmm. And so those are spaces in which um, you know I'm a migrant. My parents were migrants to the country in which they live, and their grand their parents were migrants to the country in which we live. And it was a continuing uh, you know circle. But some things, common objects, the Ghana must go bag, or that uh, uh, that bottle of Dax <laughs> or whatever it is are are uh, continue to be um, you know in. Uh, that flow. And so I don't know if we had another question, but I think for me, what I wanted, um, you know, to do with that work is, is to think about um, these laborers and question with them, um, their own uh, resilience to these, uh, these, uh, these moments of extraction, whether that be um, the extraction that comes from, you know, various countries that are in St. Vincent now, um, uh, uh, entities are uh, extracting the, um, the ash for um, uh, to, for, for gain, for, um, for road repair and all of those uh, types of things, or to, you know, what's happening um, in Tobago. And so I wanted to, you know, work with artists to think about soundscapes and what that kind of labor sounds like um, uh, with uh, sensors and whatnot. And so that's where I'm trying to go with some of these, uh, these spaces and put them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely something about the extractive. I mean, I've been thinking about mm -hmm. this a lot about land, you know, and the ways in which in order for land to become property, there's a way in which the survey, the abstraction of it so that it can become something fungible, but then the physical thing that once ownership is claimed, the putting of the fins, the, you know, there's a kind of digging out and a severing of something, of a connection potentially between whatever was continuous is now cut and there is something ab about that, you know, that that cut, right? In order to, e e you, and you could say the self is also a kind of cut out of the, the important social relations of kinship, right? That sustain us as humans, right? Because the liberal individual is such a focus of, of modernity. And, and so that cutting away or the cutting out, you know, is one way of also just kind of laying to waste whatever is left or, or around. But I also wonder for you both, you know, in, in thinking about the, the way in which you're both using sort of the imaginary, right, the artist to kind of address this, um, the poetic, you know, how that also might allow us to think think spatially or, or, or practice spatially differently, but also to address these sort of temporalities that then get set up in modernity around progress, around past, you know, the present and the future. Because I think, especially, you know, uh, with music, you know, there's always a temporal po poetry, there's always the temporal dimension, I think, to that, or narrative, for that matter. Yeah. I think with some writers, uh, the publication that's inspired by Dambu Zomaya Chera, um, it is a fictitious conversation that is uh, established between um, authors that uh, identify as Zimbabwe or who are connected to Zimbabwe in some way, where we've taken these uh, quotes by them from academic papers, from uh, journal articles, from uh, interviews, and we've organized them by theme so that people from different moments in time, people that occupied uh, similar spaces, but economics or just the social construction kept them away from each other or, or didn't, um, we also just didn't have uh, that much discourse uh, in our nation, you know, where Black individuals were really um, 
writing together, discussing together, really building in this way. Many of the many of the uh, publishing entities uh, were owned by white individuals, quite controlled uh, what people should write about, and this idea of kind of collective work and doing um, sort of work in the way that we we that we're trying to practice now. Uh, this kind of building bridges wasn't really what was. Um, happening. And so we try to recover people's voices from these uh, academic uh, papers, which are mostly written um, by uh, uh, academics from the West, from, from Europe and uh, North America. And we put people back into dialogue to try to think about what it could be like if we were really building and thinking and having this uh, kind of discursive relationship in real time even as we're going through, uh, you know, um, the effects of what we're going through. Um, and so more in a way to make a test or try to, you know, produce something that could be a prompt for our community um, or an exercise that we want to uh, keep ourselves accountable for. And we want to, to um, try to reproduce this uh, way of dialoguing and building uh, together in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I began this um, our conversation here thinking about um, the black space of the dream space or the power nap and the types of labors, uh, black labor, security labor that that seems necessary to make that possible. Those labors that stand on their feet for you know eight, ten, twelve hours um, a day. And I, I had the opportunity um, to you know to meet some really fantastic artists and curate a show last year. Um, and one of the pieces that um, struck me is by this um, image-based artist, um, Ricky Weaver. Oh. And it's, it's a piece called Amazing Grace, and it's a diptych. And one of the one, one side is a picture of her 103-year-old grandmother um, looking directly at the camera. Um, and the other side is um, a plexiglass, um, black plexiglass um, etched with a, a bell hooks quote, um, not only will I stare, I want my look to change uh, reality. Mm -hmm. And for, for her, it is about um, uh, matrilineal um, uh, lineage, about, mer um, about um, magic, about grief, but that the, the plexiglass becomes a portal, a portal to place that she says where, where you know, Black folks don't have to think about escape. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is, uh, you know, the, the kind of creative uh, conversations and the creative output and work um, that is done uh, when it comes to um, imagining, conjuring, um, and otherwise. And we could think about the Black geographic as, um, as, as not only the grandmother's, you know, possessive, uh, self-possessed stare, but also of um, those spaces, um, you know, that, that don't require escape, but that, uh, mm -hmm. that Black women's gestures can allow us to get there otherwise. Yeah. I mean, Simone, to point back to that Dax bottle, I think that's uh, where so much of my work uh, has come from, going to the African hair braiding salons and feeling like it's a space from back home that's just been teleported and, you know, mm -hmm. places in Harlem, you can find that similar space in uh, Black communities in the UK or Australia, and a place where you don't have to feel like you need to code switch out of things. Uh, all the same tropes are mapped onto the space, the gentleman walking in with sweets or selling socks, there's uh, people selling fabric and people watching a television um, and, or telling stories about home and eating food and leaving their grandmothers or their or kids mm -hmm. running around and people teaching each other whilst also kind of being involved in the uh, transaction of um, sort of hairdressing for the for the client producing this visual um, uh, image for someone. Um, I also find it quite beautiful how many of the hairstyles are named after places back mm. home, Casamans, Senegalese twist. Um, and yeah, for me, uh, you know, those spaces in Harlem were integral for, for me to find a voice to be able to kind of produce work and also to reflect on um, my own uh, sort of uh, movement and uh, what it meant, what it means to be an immigrant and what's the larger history and narrative and what the future possibilities are um, with what happens through our these patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the especially the circulation of, you know, those exactly those sort of hair practices, the music, you know, um, sounds, um, you know, the food practices as well. I was recently at a wedding in, in Johannesburg and it 
broke broke out in the electric uh, <laughs> slide, I exactly. and I was just I'm like, what? <laughs> this is you know, I mean, it was a black wedding, um, and it was just so surprising to recognize the ways in which movements and music and you know are constantly moving and moving back and forth. And I'm curious about the black geographic in that regard, Simone, and. And what that might, and, and both yours, like what this might, because I, I know there are students who have um, tuned in, um, you know, who are engaged in a Black study. And so what does the Black geographic help us do in Black studies and the ways in which, you know, we might might think through, make through uh, those, those, those connections with Blackness mm -hmm. and Black life? Well, well, for me, maybe the Black Geographic and in, in thinking of that beauty shop, I know that we on CB had this conversation. I asked you a question about, you know, if Cancalon here, um, you know, is is Black material culture, what happens when it's produced in spaces um, uh, and, and sold by spaces that are not Black folks? And so I think that the, the Black geographies can 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 ask all of these questions um, about um, about capital, about the circulation of those things um as, as as well too and so um and maybe that's where you know i would start with deep reading of the work of clyde woods and bobby wilson and ruth wilson gilmore and Catherine mckittrick and you know and others uh camille harthorn and and Brittany meshe um uh to continue to the deep study of um of the kind of intellectual contributions and work that um you know black folks are bringing to to thinking to thinking black geographies Simone, I think also bringing up the relationship that our own uh, cultural practices have with other communities is very important because um, as much as we might feel that this is kind of a, a form of um, economic exploitation, it also points to the fact that, you know, we've talked a lot over the past mm -hmm. uh, five years in the U.S. about the power of the Black dollar, you know. Mm -hmm. I often think about um, how within um, my own nation, we really don't understand the power that we have uh, now that we are all spread across the lands, you know, you can hit, you can go to any nation and find a Zimbabwean because we 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 felt we had to leave, but now we do um, occupy these spaces and we do have a sense of ownership over those spaces. It, we're in these spaces and we're gaining knowledge. We know how to move. We know the languages. We know how to excel in these spaces. We are we are we have cultural hybridity. We can. Um, you can, we can operate in our own spaces and and in the host land, but also just thinking about how many um, kinds of industries have been taken up by peoples from outside of the black community because they understand that there is a, a community that has buying power, that they understand that we do have these practices and needs is I think they, they, it, it is uh, something to note and like how do you make meaning out of that that uh, as much as we're looking at each other across the diaspora and, and mimicking and and building uh, on rituals and things together other people are, are growing an awareness of our needs and our and our practices and I don't know if it's if it's a good thing or a bad thing but I, I often do sit and uh, think about the motivation to produce um, a whole, you know, store, a whole manufacturing plant uh, for products that are tending to uh, the needs and also the, uh, you know, the aesthetic needs, the sort of the grooming, the, 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 the need for self-care uh, that some of this is being um, uh, worked on and produced or reproduced by people from outside of the community. It is mm -hmm. um, how, how much economic power, how much of industry has actually been developed uh, around uh, our own, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it still, it still is sometimes an extractive relationship or the ways in which black folks are policed in those stores mm -hmm. um, and when they're shopping for those kind of aesthetic needs um, and criminalized as well too. And so those are, you know, uh, uh, important questions. That, Patients, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate, Simone, that you pointed out, you know, the migration of, let's say, waste, right, and the ways in which those labors are, you know, engaged. Okay, so it's already been mined, it's been manufactured, sold, and then shipped and remined again. I mean, there's another kind of extraction going on um, in, in those places, in, in Accra, um, you know, which, you know, again, it's exactly the kind of same, same sort of labor regimes that are, mm -hmm. are enacted, yeah, in those. 
and those connections can be made. I think with the hair and all of those products, it's like, where are they going back to and who's, you know, funding this, um, you know, this ongoing uh, extraction of Black people's time, labor, uh, surplus and all that. And at what point in the chain are we able to be active participants? I think mm -hmm. that's what you, you um uh, presentation really brought out and when we had our conversation earlier you also did uh, talk about uh you know the gentleman the black individual that would be in the um store that sells the the hair you know the black beauty supply store it's a korean owned space but they do need one african to be in there because they do need somebody who speaks uh the language who can mm -hmm. communicate with people but that individual will not touch the cash register you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, their sole purpose is to um, make people feel comfortable and help people navigate, but also possibly to uh, participate in, in surveillance as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we do have a, a question. There, there was a comment, and I'll, I'll read the comment um, and maybe we can you know, sort of think about it as well and read the question uh, from Amelia Quinones. Uh, in Puerto Rico, impoverished people, especially Black women, or dying in car accidents because they have to work three jobs to make a living. Sometimes they can only sleep two or three hours a day, fall asleep in their cars. There have been three to four accidents of this nature recently. And I think that's very, very so sobering. And thank you um, for, for sharing that, Emilia. And uh, we do have a question from Zafu Fett. Um, is movement something that we pick up as a reaction to hundreds of years of forced immobility and forced migration? And if so, how can we use this newfound mobility to forge multiracial relationships that redefine blackness and reach horizontally to help stand in solidarity with places like Palestine, where democratically legal land theft has been immobilized and restrained uh, the natives? I think used to uh, mobile, immobilize and to restrain the natives. I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that. <laughs> I, bet, I think with my own artistic, artistic practice and movement, I have been able to do that kind of solidarity work. I think that's at the foundation of my practice um, to try to make frameworks where people from the Black diaspora can enter into conversation and dialogue um, and kind of work as someone who can support and help to project messages that people are trying to get out to communities um, that are, you know, that they're, that they're connected to or to communities that need to hear this because they need to uh, move, uh, reshape, and respond, and and come in support. Um, and definitely, there are these patterns that have happened across our histories. Some patterns have not come full cycle, such as uh, the situation in Palestine, where we have peoples that are, you know, uh, in a situation of apartheid, which uh, we feel has ended in other parts of the the world. And so, definitely, sharing resilience practices and uh, standing solidarity is is extremely important, but also being able to put yourself in a position where you can understand the complexities and uh, sort of, um, yeah, not uh, not uh, try to read each situation that might be similar as one-to-one, -one, I think is also a way that we, we show solidarity. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, this idea of, of newfound mobilities is still only for some. Um, mm -hmm. There's still, you know, in, under a, a large carceral and deportation regime, you could look at uh, the Windrush and the Windrush uh, uh, folks that have been uh, without papers and sent back to uh, Jamaica, spaces in which they hadn't been for decades, um, uh, with with no, um, you know, response um, from the leaders of the the so-called Commonwealth. And so, um, and in terms of, you know, solidarity, that work is being done. Um, and it's to continue to, to support that work of, um, you know, Black and Palestinian um, uh, solidarities around uh, resistance to occupation, but also, you know, the work of, of Black Palestinians in Palestine uh, doing, doing that work as well, too. Um, and so, you know, of course, um, in, in, a, in apartheid regimes, um, you know, such as, such as uh, that, uh, th there's always a space for, you um, uh, Sorry, I'm losing my, my train of my train of, of, of uh, thought here. But um, uh, always a space for um, uh, the type of resistances um, that are made necessary uh, by way of boycott um, and disinvestments. 
Yeah, I mean, Simone and I, we met actually. <laughs> we first met actually in the West Bank on a trip uh, sponsored by the Literary Festival of Palestine, uh, which was incredibly eye opener, to, eye opening to actually be exactly known in a landscape of apartheid, of Jim Crow segregation. I mean, it was like a, it was an amazing, and it, and it was built. I mean, it was a landscape. It was a geography mm -hmm. that has been lived every day. And it, it, is, it is pretty remarkable, that kind of question of the wasting of life, um, the, you know, and the ways in which people are forced to waste time as they have to move across borders. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary um, project of, of, of uh, disenfranchisement, displacement, and also death. Uh, uh, toward the Palestinian people. And there's when you're in that space, it's, it's just you realize the scale and scope of what's going on, which I think sometimes it's difficult for people to understand um, from, from outside. Definitely. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that the fact that we are all involved uh, in the academy in some way or within the creative arts gives us a sense of privilege and a sense of mobility. Um, and so what is the responsibility that comes with that? Or what, how do you also become disconnected even as you reflect and uh, look back? You know, when I, when I was speaking earlier, I said, I feel like my experience is from an aerial view. And at a certain point, it felt like a privileged position because I could see more since I wasn't in it. But then the, at a certain point, you do start to feel that distance. And so how do you continue to listen closely or allow uh, other people to continue teaching you um, yeah, how do you make sure that uh, when you are looking uh, at things as a scholar, that there's still that tangible realness, even if you're not living it uh, day to day, or you acknowledge it, or you acknowledge the the the, the kind of uh, space and distance, and and can be critical about uh, your own position as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll ask one last question. Um, how do you engage that as an educator? Because you're also both educators, right? And so, you know, we have our students. Um, and so sort of pedagogically, like, what does that mean for you, you know, as you teach what you teach? And, you know, if you want to share something you may have taught recently or engaged in with your students. Simone, I'll let you start. <laughs> okay, since I'm teaching, you know, I, I, I teach in a Black Studies department, and so I start um, from centering uh, the experiences and the various ways in which, you know, uh, Black folks uh, contemplate, deal with, uh, I teach on surveillance, but also, you know, have, have moments of joy, escape, rebellion, and resistance um, uh, to these things. And so, um, you know, my, my classes are always uh, women and gender studies, focused American studies focused and black studies focused. And I think in in that way, you know, I'll give you for an example, um, where there's a lot of talk right now about uh, AI and chat GPT. And so I'm having my students, uh, if they if they can always opt out if they want to explore that, but also look at, you know, um, the ways in which that type of uh, programming was built through black labor um, in, in Kenya and, uh, and exploitation and other spaces. We're thinking about content moderation and, you know, the recent um, ability of uh, the, the people, the moderators in on the continent to sue yeah. Facebook and Meta. And so to always situate it um, within the material um, and, and, and also, uh, you know, center um, Black life and Black li living conditions, Black labor, Black love. Um, and that's how I go about thinking about those things. Yeah, wonderful. How no. I'm going to uh, do this is by getting Simone to come and speak to my design students <laughs> about <laughs> exploitation and chat GPT. Uh, right now, we are um, working with uh, the first years and second years to think about invisibility and voids, um, to think about uh, that in relationship to uh, publication production and the role of the archive um, and our role as we produce objects that can go into the archive and how we can um, think about adding in. Uh, that our work is additive so we can produce what has been missing um, and also uh, produce a work that is questioning uh, what uh, we could call the, the canon, but I don't like to use that, that terminology. Um, but, but actually uh, in my uh, um, classrooms, I make sure that the students understand that they're studying with me and that when they're studying with me, they're studying in a way that they, um, that, they we're producing knowledge in a way that uh, would happen only with somebody like me. I make sure that I'm centering where I come from because I want to um, give the students a sort of pattern and precedent 
that they're allowed to look at their own uh, history and uh, their own biography as valid, um, that they can produce a history and uh, ideas of the future uh, from that uh, point. Um, but also to acknowledge that we are all so many different people as we stand next to each other in the academy and that all of our identities are in the room and, and should be expressed through all of the technical sophistication that we are working through when we talk about design and engineering. And so being able to point to where that lives uh, within my own history, within my own biography, within um, the material culture um, and artistic, artistic practices um, of my own community. I think I, I'm uh, honoring uh, that in everybody else's uh, culture and giving them an opportunity to uh, look back at that. Um, but also it's so important for us to be able to understand each other so as, as we move uh, forward. So opening up the space, uh, demystifying certain things sometimes also shows us the connections that we have. Um, one of my uh, students from Ghana is producing a project um, on libation and was really uh, think, talking about in this way, which uh, where he felt that other people were not going to be able to enter into uh, the conversation until other students and myself started talking about moments where libation is practiced in our communities, even in a secular way. Um, and it, you know, just really brought things together and allowed him to understand the richness of that specific uh, uh, module in his culture in a totally different uh, way. So that's, that's how I try to work with the students in my, in my classes. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both um, for, um, you know, kind of really sharing, sharing your practices, sharing um, your intellectual, your creative, also your pedagogical practices, I think, um, with our audience today. And it, it was a really rich um, and uh, thoughtful and also provocative conversation. I was furiously taking notes. Uh, what is that reference? Um, and I'm going to go back and look at a number of the references, the books, your publications, Nancy, the people that you were just talking about, Simone. So uh, this is a really amazing and very generous um, uh, 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 conversation. So I just want to say thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties. Even no when you're from a from <laughs> technology hub, the internet can go down. That's what happens. You left when us with a great playlist. So thank yeah, you. I know, I know, I know. We had a lovely it's, interlude. It's so deep. It's so deep. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. You're welcome. And so I, I just want to say uh, also a special thanks to our dedicated colleagues, uh, Sharon Harris, who is our logistical queen, Sean Mendoza, who keeps things running, and also to our assistants, Olivia Pearson, Josh Agubata, and James Jenning, um, who are essential to shaping today's events. And I just want to share a few of the upcoming events. Um, we have a lecture coming up from Dr. Uh, Velika Smelders, who is a curator of a show called 10 True Stories of Dutch Colonial Slavery, which was at the Rijksmuseum, but will be at the UN in New York. There is a really great write-up of the show, uh, I think yesterday, in Hyperallergic. Um, and that will be with our colleague, Dr. Natasha Lightfoot on February 25th. Um, we also have a conversations coming up uh, with Dr. Adolf Reed about his book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives with Dr. Barbara Fields and Dr. Frank A. Gritty. That's March 1st. And for our Zora Neale Hurston lecture on March 8th uh, will be Dr. Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. Um, so more Black geographies. So for more information about this and other events, please see our website, afamstudies.columbia.edu. And I wanna thank our audience um, for uh, joining us, for your insightful questions, and um, please take care and be well. Thank you.